Brace yourself. It's pretty easy to get lost in reminiscence of the 3D collectathon platformer, at least in the days of the Nintendo 64. This was a genre so revered by so many that it bordered on full on idolization. It was royalty in the console's castle, the keystone of a generation of gamers, but also one that time forgot. Collectathon 3D platformers lost their grip on cultural relevance beyond the 90s, leading them to fall into obscurity. The genre's disappearance left a void that many folks couldn't bear, and despite that yearning, the 3D platformer genre was hesitant to revisit that philosophy. That scope of adventure was missing from the field for more than a decade, and it left many conflicted on what exactly made the collectathon so important. But one of the first big releases for the genre's revival during the 2010s was a controversial one. Despite its immense financial support, it led its vocal fans to doubt their memories, and question whether this really was something worth bringing back. Maybe, just maybe, there was some baggage to this trip home. Today we're taking a look at the bizarre creature known as Ukulele, a title that was meant to revitalize an entire genre of games, but ultimately became one of the most polarizing releases in the last decade. Perhaps if we can examine it closely enough, we can see why Platonic's project ended up the way it did, and what the future holds for the 3D collectathon platformer genre. I remember first hearing of Ukulele in 2012, but when I did, it was not under that name. The project Minji Jongo, a reference to the Banjo-Tooie boss of the same name, appeared on Twitter in September of that year, claiming to be a spiritual successor to Banjo-Tooie. It was originally going to be held by former members of Rare, and was dubbed a golden opportunity to bring attention back to collectathon platformers of the Nintendo 64 years. It was an exciting prospect for everyone involved, and as a fan of the Banjo-Kazooie series, I was definitely interested. Sadly, the Minji Jongo project ran into snags, including but not limited to balancing additional projects by the staff, as updates dwindled fan faith did as well. It wasn't until 2014 that, during an AMA on Reddit, the project's composer Grant Kirkhope, also composer for Banjo-Kazooie and Tui's music, said that Minji Jongo wasn't going to happen. There was supposedly a pub meeting where demo levels and character designs were discussed, but it simply wasn't enough to keep development momentum going. Minji Jongo was over. Or so many of us thought. The Minji Jongo Twitter posted a tweet on December 21st, 2014, simply reading, Control. Two other tweets appeared on December 24th and 31st, reading Alt and Delete. Respectively, this sequence of tweets was some of the first communication from the account since the Minji Jongo project's disillusion, and it didn't take a rocket scientist to deduce that Control Alt Delete could easily mean reboot. In fact, it was Grant Kirkhope himself that kind of spilled the beans on what the Twitter account was up to. Lo and behold, after the Twitter account was rebranded as Playtonic Games, the account officially blew the lid off of the new project, dubbed Project Ukulele, which would appear on Kickstarter for crowdfunding later that year. Primetime hit, and Project Ukulele was officially renamed to Ukulele, a throwback to the naming convention of Banjo-Kazooie. To no one's surprise, Ukulele was immediately funded with stretch goals getting checked off by the hour. As the Kickstarter closed, the excitement was uncontainable. It very well could have been the Banjo 3E that so many others wanted. So I built this up a lot, and yeah, Ukulele didn't release to fanfare. The reviews were all over the place, some adoring the classic Collectathon sensibilities, others putting it next to Broken Age and Mighty No. 9 as a colossal Kickstarter failure. But me? I've read the reviews, I've seen the videos, but I've never actually gotten my hands on ukulele until now. So better late than never, I suppose. Considering I've been tracking this project for more than five years, I was bound to finally check it out myself. But there's one thing I want to disclose. I have nostalgia for this type of game. Banjo-Kazooie and Banjo-Tooie are two of my all-time favorite games. They're polished, effortlessly giving me almost everything I could want in a game like either one of them. But that's something to note, that magic word, nostalgia. According to Merriam-Webster, nostalgia is defined as a wistful or excessively sentimental yearning for return to of some past period or irrecoverable condition. It's a desire to revisit something awesome from the past. Nostalgia is inherent to Ukulele's existence, it's in the game's DNA. From its support on Kickstarter to the hype leading to launch, nostalgia was the fuel to its fire. It got people to donate money to a promise that wasn't guaranteed to be good. Nostalgia can be just as much a bad thing as it can be a good thing, 
and I don't think we should ignore that. Nostalgia can give us retro throwbacks that show us the best possible parts of the games we loved as kids, but at the same time, nostalgia can also give us dated and unpolished experiences that make the past look totally archaic and undesirable. It's the ultimate double-edged sword. So we're going to see how Ukulele's focus on nostalgia hits its bottom line. For disclosure, I'm playing the game on PlayStation 4, and playing it with all patches released prior to February 2018 installed. I know that the early builds of the game had numerous technical issues, but I won't be discussing the launch day version of the game in this video. So, how can we analyze a game's nostalgia? It's a pretty abstract question to ask, but I think I can nail it down into something manageable. There are two major questions that should be answered when trying to revitalize a mechanic that many would consider nostalgic. One. What about this mechanic made it exciting and interesting when it was used in the past? And two, what about this mechanic made it eventually lose prevalence and fall out of favor? The first question is probably the easiest to answer of the two, because the demand for a nostalgia-driven idea is usually displayed the loudest. As they say, absence makes the heart grow fonder, and the lack of prevalence of a game design concept is likely going to make the player reminiscent, even if that reminiscence is influenced by rose-colored glasses. Understanding why Banjo-Kazooie and 3D platformers like it were so treasured by fans comes down to the game's design, the fundamental elements of what make a collectathon. There are many different concepts working simultaneously in the best examples of the genre, but I'll stick to Banjo-Kazooie for the time being since it's the most relevant, and his ukulele was considered to be a spiritual successor to the game during its Kickstarter. Banjo-Kazooie's design may seem to be typical when it comes to 3D platformers, but it was the game's focus on three major elements that gave it such a powerful place in the gaming landscape. Puzzles, collectibles, and exploration. I'll take a look at each of these elements within the context of Banjo-Kazooie, and perhaps they will show why Collectathons made such a grand mark for games. The puzzles in Banjo-Kazooie were key to the challenges, as solving them gave players an invigorating sense of accomplishment. The puzzles were also not limited to simply solving a riddle or answering a question. Sometimes they demanded a well-timed platforming feat, which combines understanding a level's features and how they can be used, with understanding Banjo and Kazooie's movesets and how they can be implemented. Puzzles could actually be considered procedures, or understanding an algorithm of the moves in combination with the levels themselves. For example, it was fun discovering how lit windows can be broken in Mad Monster Mansion to find hidden rooms in the house. Discovery in general is very satisfying, and that satisfaction is why puzzles are so widely used in video games, even if the game is a platformer and not a straight-up puzzle game. They are overcoming an obstacle, a challenge, and it gives the player a good feeling of accomplishment, which helps raise their morale and skill building, and makes progression through the game all the more enticing to them. Collectibles acted as the main crux of objectives, and it gave the player the satisfaction of finding a treasure by overcoming a challenge, but they weren't limited to just being rewards. More common collectibles in Banjo-Kazooie, specifically the notes, eggs, and feathers, were ways to populate a world while simultaneously creating paths for the player to navigate. Even if they were filled to capacity on eggs and feathers, the player could still understand that the area is meant to be traversed simply by seeing the eggs and feathers location. The Jiggies acted as the major collectibles of Banjo-Kazooie, so anytime a Jiggy's location is discovered, the player knows that there's to be a challenge to overcome within the immediate area. Overall, collectibles manage to fill a world and give it a sense of breadth and density, while also providing explicit reward for overcoming a challenge. Together, puzzles and collectibles fuel the third pillar of the collectathon genre's design, exploration. As far back as Super Mario 64, Discovery was an extremely important element to making a compelling 3D platformer. Simply wandering around and playing with the navigational moveset could lead to buried treasure, whether intentional or not. The collectibles, as already stated, serve the purpose of leading the player in a particular direction, while also signifying when a challenge is meant to be discovered. Puzzles add that additional layer of introspection, encouraging a player to wander and discover solutions within their grasp. Some of my best gaming memories come from exploring levels in both Banjo-Kazooie and Banjo-Tooie, finding hidden items and new puzzles to solve. Ultimately, the importance comes from the player's own curiosity, which exploration circulates entirely. So let's see if Ukulele uses each of these three pillars to structure itself as a collectathon. Ukulele's focus on puzzles isn't particularly deep, but then again the original Banjo-Kazooie's wasn't either. 
Compared to many other 3D platformers of the era, Banjo-Kazooie's toolbox was actually quite small, and I'd argue that Ukulele's is just as minimalist. Sadly, unlike Banjo-Kazooie's world, Ukulele's world doesn't serve the player challenges in particularly interesting ways. Platforming obstacle courses might be interesting in the opening level, but going through rings so much throughout the entire game simply shows a lack of creativity. Reusing ideas is a chronic issue in Ukulele, making puzzles feel repetitive and unimaginative. Other puzzles take a totally different extreme and lack consistency to the point of frustration. The block that hides this Ghost Rider item was a notorious sore spot, as the player must first crack it with a sonar wave, then destroy it. This contradicts many other situations where the block appears to be made of ice, so it's an easy assumption to think that fire is required, which is an erroneous claim. Completing puzzles in ukulele quickly became checks on a checklist. I was happy seeing my completion percentage go up, but I wasn't happy actually completing them. There are simply too many moments in ukulele's challenges that are either repetitive or flat out uninteresting. Collectibles are another major pillar of collectathons that ukulele gets wrong. Due to the size of its worlds, ukulele has plenty of trouble when it comes to populating its space, along with proper placement. It baffles me how poorly some of the most basic of collectibles are located. Quills, which are used to progress via buying moves from Trouser the Snake, along with getting a pagey, are placed in inconvenient locations. There were multiple times where I was exploring what appeared to be a secretive area, looking out for a pagey, or something even rarer, like a power bar extender or health extender. To my disappointment, what I found was a single quill. For such a crucial and plentiful item, placing them in such locations is a ridiculous idea. The world sizes make collectibles appear more secretive than they are, which contradicts the separate motive of guiding the player. A player shouldn't have to scour every point of a gigantic map with an item detector tonic in tow solely to feel accomplishment in collectible hunting. If ukulele had more secondary or tertiary items, then maybe collectible hunting would feel more satisfying. Sadly, this isn't the case. Finally, exploring each world in ukulele is probably the most successful of the three major pillars, but even that is debatable when it comes to quality. While Platonic did add more pages to find in each world of ukulele than Jiggies in each world of Banjo-Kazooie, there still manages to be a lot of empty space. The vacuous level design makes exploring feel tedious, especially when your major movement skill, the roll, has a power bar that requires a cooldown after using it up. Discovery is a major part of Banjo-Kazooie's best moments, but Ukulele doesn't offer too many moments of genuine discovery, and many of the best examples are in the first couple of worlds. Tribal Stack Tropics is easily the best design level in the game due to its accommodating size and challenges that introduce the player to the mechanics fluidly. There are also plenty of harrowing platformer challenges that make discovering the path to reward all the more exciting. However, Expanding Worlds manages to open up a can of worms that damages the level's tight design. We'll pick up on that point later, but I will say that Expanding Worlds is ultimately a bad idea for a collectathon to contain. Banjo-Kazooie's sensible puzzle design and intelligent use of collectibles made exploring for new challenges intuitive. Ukulele shares some of these better uses, but I still believe that it misses the mark in understanding why these were so essential to a successful collectathon like its predecessor. So hopefully I've explained what made collectathon platformers so successful and memorable but that's only one half of the mystery deciphered. 3D platformers suffered a considerable decline once the industry evolved into the 7th and 8th generation of consoles. While Nintendo continued to make games featuring their mascot Mario, the platformers weren't open world in the same way Super Mario 64 was. Super Mario Galaxy on the Wii marked a departure from open-ended levels in favor of linear, abstractly designed challenges that played with gravity, momentum, and general physics. You could also cite the rise of first-person shooters like Halo and action games like Grand Theft Auto 3 to a decline in public favor of platformers, but I want to speak about internal aspects for this discussion. While many game series and genres captured much of platformers' thunder, I do believe that the decline of 3D collectathon platformers was partially at the fault of the genre itself, and the direction many developers were taking it. So what did 3D platformers do that made them less popular, if anything at all? Let's try and examine this, starting with a familiar game that's essential when figuring Ukulele's history, Banjo-Tooie. Banjo-Tooie is a game that I believe has gotten a lot of criticism on YouTube as of late, which surprised me because I always thought that it was a great game, perhaps even better than Kazooie. However, the criticism I've heard focused on two major issues, the intricacy of its puzzles and, probably the biggest criticism, the size of its levels. 
Banjo-Tooie was designed to be expansive, with levels being interconnected both in individual puzzles and in physical secret passageways. Banjo-Tooie was an enormous game, much to some gamers' displeasure, and I think that it contributed to the agoraphobic fatigue that led to Collectathon's downfall. Banjo-Tooie's polarizing design direction is very apparent in Ukulele. As stated earlier, Ukulele was originally designed to be a spiritual successor to Banjo-Tooie, under the name Minji Jongo and the remnants of that direction are still in the final build. Ukulele's worlds are already pretty spacious, and they don't have the collectibles to populate them to feel full. But once levels are expanded, the issue goes from an annoyance to a genuine flaw. Going back to Tribal Stack Tropics, the first incarnation of the level is probably what I'd call the ideal size for a collectathon level, especially as the first level. It's big enough to accommodate practice and mastery of the movement mechanics, but small enough where traversal doesn't feel like a chore. Even with the lack of collectibles in many parts of the level, Tribal Stack Tropics hits the bullseye for level size, making it one of the best levels in the game and also a great entry point to the gameplay itself. However, once you expand the level, things simply get too spacious. Tribal Stack Tropics multi-tiered monument, cliffside up to Rampo, mountain path to the gem for Shovel Knight, the path to Nimbo, along with other smaller challenges all populate the level in poor density, in almost scattered patterns. Many of these involve scaling a tower and completing a simple puzzle or fighting a weak enemy. Other levels like Capital Casino and definitely Galleon Galaxy, suffer from their stage size, making areas too big and empty to hold the player's interest. Large game worlds have recently gotten plenty of backlash with their size feeling unaccommodating for both navigation and integrating interesting objectives, as seen in games like Assassin's Creed. So it was simply inevitable that Ukulele's design would ultimately be maligned. Compare this to how Banjo-Tooie manages its world size. Banjo-Tooie had multi-step puzzles to solve and constant backtracking to try out new skills in other contexts, but the puzzle's complexity are what made the worlds feel interconnected, as if they are all operating together in real time. This is actually a good transition into another trend that Ukulele mishandles, keeping challenges fresh and interesting. Banjo-Kazooie had the advantage of being one of the first big collectathons to focus on exploration and puzzle solving which makes its limited moveset for the titular duo all the more impressive. The levels accommodated the moveset with puzzles that almost always focused on the environment, which helped keep things fresh and exciting for the player. Even when the player was doing the exact same thing multiple times, the challenges still felt interesting thanks to environmental variety and framing. Banjo-Tooie changed the course and delivered multi-layered puzzle solutions and interconnected worlds. With larger size and more moves to use, the puzzles could accomplish higher levels of density and complexity which was a big part of Banjo-Tooie's appeal. In contrast, Ukulele's obstacles are simply too rudimentary. While I understand the advantage of keeping different challenges simple in their structure, Ukulele's worlds simply don't accommodate for the duo's similar mechanics. It's like trying to make a Banjo-Tooie-sized world, but with mechanics suited to Banjo-Kazooie. Because of the limited moveset and lower amounts of environmental creativity, Ukulele's challenges are reused ad nauseum. The cloud race in Tribal Stack Tropics is repeated, so is climbing the mountains. Capital Casino's slot machines are redundant despite their minute differences, and Galleon Galaxy's focus on flight makes simply getting around an absolute chore. It really boggles my mind that Ukulele is so drained when it comes to creativity, especially considering it originated as a spiritual successor to Banjo-Tooie, a game that to this day astounds me with its creative design. But another reason the collectathon genre likely fell out of favor is a symptom that Ukulele, oddly enough, avoids. But there is another rare title that clearly displays the issue, and I think it's appropriate when discussing this symptom. Let's take a look at Donkey Kong 64. Before going in, I want to say that I think Donkey Kong 64 is actually a pretty great game to me. The scene placement and world design felt like it struck a good balance between exploration and coherence. Jungle Japes, for example, has many nooks and crannies to explore, and the challenges all took advantage of moves and techniques that fit each character's style and design. I think the game actually does a surprisingly good job at holding up today. But ignoring Donkey Kong 64's flaws is regressive, and its approach to collectibles is pretty bad. Five characters means five times the collectibles, as certain colored items can only be picked up by a specific Kong. This saturated the worlds with collectibles that didn't do a good job of leading the player to a challenge, making the world feel cluttered, but divided. Donkey Kong 64 showed that collectible density can lead to poor design. And as said earlier, these collectibles don't necessarily have much purpose. It all felt very cluttered. 
I'm bringing this all up because ukulele does the exact opposite. Its collectibles are obnoxiously rare. For a game whose entire genre had collectibles as a core mechanic, it really blows my mind just how few collectibles exist in ukulele. This negatively contributed to the game's world size, making parts of the stage feel empty and purposeless. I do applaud ukulele for not suffering from the same pitfall as DK64, but it took its efforts to the negative extreme. The quills in particular are clearly an important collectible, as you spend them to receive new moves from Trouser, but their placement is usually done in isolated situations, where two or three of them are placed almost at random. And without anything like eggs or feathers to use, collectible hunting often becomes the exception rather than the rule. Ukulele has a backwards mentality where it desires to revitalize collectathons while leaving almost nothing to actually collect, and that logic simply doesn't make sense. It's easy to see that world size and collectible placement are linked extremely tightly, which is something ukulele doesn't display. Collectibles don't have a clear incentive to their placement. They have inherent value as currency, but that doesn't give them any external purpose when it comes to where they're located and why. The large world size only exacerbates the already ingrained issue of collectible placement, so the player has to wander around an entire level just to find a low-tier item. It's such a regressive mentality. One that totally contrasts the stages in Banjo-Kazooie where proper item placement and world construction felt inseparable. As I said in my video on Banjo-Kazooie Nuts and Bolts, I do believe that Ukulele's creation, along with the creation of other collectathon games like A Hat in Time, were driven by the same levels of nostalgia. The disrespect and ignorance that Nuts and Bolts had toward collectathons, intentional or otherwise, drove many longtime fans of the genre to speak up, and yearn for games like Banjo Kazooie loudly and publicly. When the demand is so apparent, developers don't feel like making these kinds of games is a big risk, so they appear without as much hesitation. Playtonic were eager to get back in the field and make the kinds of games their staff built their success on, and I can't help but appreciate that enthusiasm. But I think Ukulele overlooked why people liked collectathons in the first place, and the final product definitely makes this obvious. Sure, you have the colorful art direction and quirky soundtrack, but you need to preserve the gameplay's appeal first and foremost. Banjo Kazooie felt like an adventure, one where there was no downtime to distract and bore the player. It felt deliberate, like there was a method to its madness, and over time, Banjo Kazooie retained its iconic status because of the developer's deliberation when designing it. But Ukulele's design components just feel at odds with themselves, and I can't help but be disappointed by that. There are so many misinterpretations of the genre's appeal throughout the game. Bad design shouldn't be celebrated, even in the course of nostalgia, and simply brushing off criticism of these design directions in the name of retro sensibilities is only going to hinder the genre's second wind. It's something that will ultimately lead to missing the mark. Nostalgia is pretty inescapable in the gaming landscape. I'll openly admit that some of my favorite games are cruxed by nostalgia, like Sonic 3 and Knuckles on the Sega Genesis, a game that has since become more criticized now than it ever was when I was a kid. But despite my love of the game, I do think that there are other games that improve on what Sonic 3 and Knuckles did. Freedom Planet is a good example of this. It has more fluid movement, more streamlined level design, and an overall better sense of pacing. It's why I believe Freedom Planet to be such a success even though most of its positive reception was likely driven by nostalgia for the older Sonic games. It's not easy to keep old ideas from feeling dated, so I do give Platonic credit for stepping up to the plate and trying their hand at revitalizing what is now an uncommon gameplay style for a modern audience. But at the same time, I can't confidently say that Ukulele is a successful interpretation of that style. There's a lot to learn from the past, but without that introspection and context of the genre's downfall, there's no way to build on it. I'm hoping Platonic gives the genre another go, because criticisms aside, Ukulele isn't the dumpster fire some online personalities have claimed it to be. Even more so, I'm hoping Ukulele's mediocre quality is a learning experience for Platonic, one that will springboard toward their success in the future. I want to see them improve, and I want to see them deliver another game that makes Ukulele's problems look like bitter memories. But without attentively studying why collectathons were great, along with why they disappeared. The studio is going to be seeing the entire genre through nostalgia goggles, and in the end, I expect much more from them than that.